Check, check, check. All right. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Um, you uh, slowly find your seats, no rush. Um, and uh, if I could just have your attention for a minute, uh, we'll be getting started in just a second. Um, I just wanted to welcome everyone. Is this your first time at a Pivotal office? Couple, welcome, okay. Uh, I used to work here, but uh, now I work at a company called Elastic. Uh, anyone heard of Elastic or Elasticsearch? Just checking, you never know. <laughs> uh, cool. Um, if you're not familiar with Pivotal, um, they are our hosts. Uh, they've provided the delicious food and this amazing venue. Um, so if you're looking to support Pivotal, they do a lot of open source uh, development work. Uh, anyone heard of Spring Framework? This is a trick question. You should have all heard of Spring Framework. Okay, just checking. Anyone heard of Apache Tomcat? This is also a trick question. Um, they, believe it or not, uh, are the 75% committers for Apache Tomcat, something you probably didn't know. Uh, former uh, Spring Source uh, acquisition. Um, and RabbitMQ, any RabbitMQ users? Couple? Okay, so these are all open source things that, that, that Pivotal does, right? Um, and they do a few other things in open source as well. Uh, Cloud Foundry, anyone heard of Cloud Foundry or use Cloud Foundry? Couple, okay, great. Uh, and um, they're also uh, doing some forays into uh, data warehousing based on Postgres. Uh, so there's, they have something called Greenplum, which they got from a, a EMC acquisition that they donated. Uh, and there's yet another, I think one of the last big open source projects they support is something called Apache Geode. Uh, if anyone's ever heard of like Memcache D or Infinispan or Oracle Coherence or anything of this nature, like the in-memory data grid, right? This is an object store. You put stuff into it, it kind of replicates across a bunch of, uh, replicates itself across a cluster uh, and maintains state for you. This kind of in-memory distributed data grid, they have an open source project called Apache Geode uh, that, that focuses on that sort of stuff. But um, uh, I am your organizer. My name is Peter. Uh, and uh, I kind of inherited the Jug group from um, some gentleman at Twitter who started it off, uh, and a guy named Ruse from Gradle. Uh, and yeah, uh, sorry, say again? Yes, exactly, Alexander, yeah. Uh, and in fact, we may have him coming soon. Uh, and one of his colleagues, uh, they did a, I saw a tweet, uh, some of the guys at Twitter were talking about uh, Grawl and machine learning, and I thought that sounded kind of cool. Uh, would that be of interest to anyone, Grawl and machine learning? Has anyone heard about Grawl VM? Okay, cool. Um, so we might be having that topic soon. Um, please, I'm, I'm fairly friendly. Come talk to me afterwards. I'd love to hear what you're working on. Uh, would you like to present? Uh, do you know people who would like to present? Uh, we're always looking for trying to help out new speakers uh, getting started um, in the industry as well as uh, rock star experienced speakers that work at IntelliJ, uh, excuse me, JetBrains, like Anton here. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, so uh, would love any topics or uh, you know, friends that, of yours that, that are interested in presenting. Uh, with that, let me let Anton introduce himself. I already hit start on the recording, so I think we're, I think we're okay. Um, phone. There you go. Perfect. It even works. Yes, it does. I know, this whole tech thing, it's amazing. Yes, um, 21st talk. century. 21st century, we're here. Yeah, Kotlin's really cool. Uh, I used to be the, uh, the sort of face of Spring Framework marketing, uh, and there was a lot of interest in Kotlin. Um, some of the uh, early on Spring team folks uh, were Groovy committers like um, uh, that, that used to work here. Um, and Groovy, I think, is, is still quite popular as a JVM language, but uh, the Spring team has really uh, looked at Kotlin pretty hard, and they're doing some great integration work all the way down to coroutines, I think. I've seen some blog posts yeah. uh, from Spring Team recently, so. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, uh, Kofu as well, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's some fun work going on in the Spring Team and Kotlin uh, with Spring Boot. So uh, if you're Spring users, uh, you can definitely use Kotlin with Spring. Um, and I think with that, I'm just gonna let you kind of cue it up and talk a little bit about uh, tonight's topic and just say, right. put your hands together for Anton uh, and thank him for, for coming out. Thank you. And pleasure to come here. So my name is Anton. You can help. I sometimes tweet something interesting, but mostly I retweet people that tweet something interesting instead of me. Um, I'm a developer of brains, so I'm not really uh, writing product code. I'm 
thinking about what we do and uh, doing this kind of presentations. Uh, I might not be really entertaining right now because it's 3 a.m. my time. I'm coming from Europe um, in Estonia, so it's, it's not even 3 a.m., it's 4 a.m. right now. Um, and I just landed yesterday, so it's a little bit tricky. So I'm going to talk to you about Kotlin and especially the domain specific languages that you can make with Kotlin. Um, how many of you have used Kotlin? I mean, something, maybe half of you, or, or maybe half of you. So it's, it's a fairly new language compared to, you know, to Java, for instance, or to any other languages. And uh, it feels pretty modern. If you, have, if you try to compare to any other languages out there, it's probably like uh, Kotlin, TypeScript, and Swift are those who feel very modern. Uh, one of the properties for those languages is that they make, make it comfortable to write um, kind of really idiomatic code that doesn't really look like uh, the, the program uh, or the code in this language itself, but it looks like a DSL or like a specific format, I would say. And this makes configuration the notion of infrastructure as code or configuration as code, uh, this language has become very um, kind of convenient for this kind of task. So today we are going to of this. How you know, create your own DSL. So I don't know, should I be speaking like this or like this? Straightforward that okay, this one is better. All right, so before we go, before we proceed, a little bit of marketing right here. So, you know, the Kotlin conference here in San Francisco. Uh, so, this year, sir? correct, it's for, for AM, as I said. Uh, so two years ago, it was in San Francisco last year in Amsterdam. This year, it's coming to Copenhagen. So if you are feeling like traveling to Europe, you know, that's the place to go. But it will be cold. It, it's December and it's Denmark, not Italy. So, yeah. Okay, anyways, if you talk about the main specific things, do you have any associations when you hear this kind of idiom? Like, it's the main specific, it's tailored for something specific, right? For some specific task. And if we talk about the uh, DSLs, like the main specific languages tailored for these specific tasks, uh, we always have to think also like other external or other internal. But by the external, we usually mean that we have to develop a grammar, develop our own parser, lexer, generator, and so on. And at JetBrains, we actually have this kind of, let's say, a tool that helps you developing external DSLs. So that's uh, called MPS. Sometimes it's, this sticker is confused with Kotlin because people can turn it and see it set as a K, but it's actually M. And it looks like this. So you kind of get, it's, it's a whole workbench. You develop a grammar, you get a, a special editor for that DSL right out of the box, it's an IntelliJ idea. Uh, but it has a, quite a steep uh, learning curve and it's, let's say it has its own niche. Uh, so people kind of use it to develop uh, languages, external DSLs for the specific needs like uh, programmable controllers, Logic first, embedded systems, and, and so on. That's what I have seen. We have tried developing uh, our own languages for, let's say, server side development, and uh, UTrack was the kind of a test bed for that. But now uh, we see that it's not how, how uh, applications are going to be developed, and uh, UTrack was rewritten in, uh, let's say, conventional uh, programming language right now. 
Uh, and by the internal languages, by the internal DSLs, we mean that we don't really need to uh, develop a grammar. We develop a vocabulary which we use in a host language with its own syntactic let's say, abilities. And this syn the syntax of uh, host programming language becomes, let's say, the limitation of, of your DSL, how, you can, how, how much you can express with it. Uh, so we stay on the dark side because we talk about Kotlin and we're going to talk about the internal DSLs. We are not going to talk about you know, how to develop your own grammar. Let me go over a few examples that are already out there. You can use them as libraries. That's one of the benefits that we will see that we actually, the, 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 the DSL that you develop will be uh, an internal DSL that can be packaged, packaged within a library and you can reuse it between multiple products. So this example here, if you don't know, uh, oh, sorry, uh, creates an HTML document, right? Easy to understand. Okay, there are some small syntactic elements that might not be, okay, you probably want me to use this one? If you can, that'd be great. Okay. Let's try that. I just switch it off. Turn it on? Or do I have to turn it on? One, two, three, four, five. Good. All right, the other one, Anko. Are there any Android developers in the room? You probably are familiar with it. Right? If you tried Kotlin, um, maybe you have tried this library as well. That's a library that helps you to uh, create layouts in Kotlin, right? Even, again, if you don't, don't know Kotlin, you still can com comprehend what it is there. It's the, the two fields, two text fields, name and password, and a button. So it's obviously a submit form. Uh, another one, so Gradle is taking up on Kotlin. So uh, if you are, you know, feeling adventurous, you probably want to try Kotlin DSL in Gradle. Uh, another one is a library for database access developed at JetBrains. So it's kind of quite easy to read. We open a transaction, we create a CTS table, we um, make, a, like, make a query or make, make an insert and make a query and iterate over the results, right? Another one is uh, just some kind of a hobby project which I found on GitHub. Um, you know, Vadin framework. Um, not, not its programming model is not not is not too complicated. Feels like Swing, like, like programming Swing mostly. But uh, it's it's again about the layouts and uh, uh, with this DSL that was created for Vadin, it's easy to kind of create a structure um, for the layout. Another one, if you have tried developing Kubernetes uh, configuration files, one of our former developers was so annoyed by writing YAML himself, so he created a DSL for that in Kotlin. And in TeamCity, which we develop uh, internally at JetBrains, we, the DCI server, uh, if anyone is using it, you can actually create uh, configurations in Kotlin, and that's what I'm going to show as well. Uh, so, the last example I have here is a KTOR framework for like for web applications, also developed internally at JetBrains. This example is interesting in a way that you will see a routing DSL mixture with HTML DSL. So you have two DSLs intermixed in one file, right? How is it possible that we have two languages in one file? Because our host language is Kotlin. It's all the same, it's like valid Kotlin code. We can intermix as many DSLs, internal DSLs as we want. That's pretty cool. Did you notice something about all those examples? They are similar in a way. Can you tell how they are similar? 
What was similar, for instance? Same shape, you mean what structure? Verb, nesting, verb, nesting, okay. So let's confirm that. So usually it starts with some kind of a entry point, let's say foo, and it follows by a block, and there is a nested block, and there's some kind of an assignment, and it could be assignment of a, of a block, and instead of a, just a value as a string, we could create some kind of an object in there. And uh, it's all valid Kotlin code again. It could be syntax highlighted and uh, completed in the IDE and so on. It feels like magic when you really see it. All right, let's, let's write some code. I will be, you know, picking up the microphone and, and putting it back again so it will not be really convenient. But anyways, let's try. Um, or typing with my one, one hand. Anyways, so I have an example here. Uh, a few classes in my package file. I hope everything is visible, right? Okay, so there is a client, there is a client builder, there is a company, there is a company builder, Twitter, Twitter builder. And an example of the code that we have here, just, you know, a baby code. Everybody can read it and understand what it is, right? Maybe we will have to read it one like line by line because it's pretty terse, uh, but still you can understand. So let's try uh, to take this Java code and start converting it step by step in small steps and see what kind of features from a Kotlin language we can use to actually create our own DSL for, for the same thing. It's a small example, but you will see how, how easy it is. So I, it probably will be so that I will have to make pauses between, you know, typing and speaking. Um, but anyways, so what do we need to execute the program? We probably need a main function, right? Copy paste it here. The IDE knows that we are pasting a Java code into a Kotlin file, so it suggests to convert it a little bit so it can do some minor conversions for you up front. You, those who have used Kotlin already probably have experienced that. Um, what's going on? Okay. So there are a few conversions we have done already just by copy pasting this code here. First of all, the type. Instead of the type, we have val, right? It was final type definition, variable name, something. Now it's val. Uh, on the right, we don't have a new K word. That's a compilation error. Uh, we don't have a semicolon in Kotlin. That's actually was like when when I first saw Kotlin quite quite a new, uh, quite many years ago. I thought like okay, semicolon not a big deal. I I can type semicolon. It's not like a killer feature. But when I was programming for like in Kotlin for months, and I went back to Java, it was like the biggest pain I experienced was like that I always missed typing the semicolon there. Um, again, next one, next conversion was that uh, <clears throat> in the original code, we are calling a setter. In here, we have, like in Kotlin, we have properties. Uh, so instead of call, calling a setter, we are actually calling a setter, but we, the, the syntax looks like if we have a field assignment. Actually, it's a setter if we uh, press to go to definition, command B, we actually get to the setter. So, okay. And the last one is that we have string interpolation built in, in Kotlin, right? So we have string and we could use a dollar to actually interpolate the, uh, the value of uh, client right in the string. So let's see how how it works, what's the result of this program. Check if it compiles. So instead of writing unit tests, we are actually executing. All right, so we have an output. And what it is, 
it's um, it's just a reference, right? The client class currently doesn't have a two string method. Um, what would you do to normally to pretty print something on the terminal instead of just you know you need a two string method, right? What if you have the class, the client class, somewhere in a jar? You cannot change it. What would you do normally in Java? Either subclass it, or have a wrapper, or have a client util static method that receives a client instance and then returns a string. So in Kotlin, we do practically the same, but the idiomatic way to do that is through the extension method. So we kind of <clears throat> mix in a new method into the namespace of the existing class, even though it's somewhere in a package or in a library. Client, client, let's say to console, console string. Okay. And it's going to return a string. And like this. So return. And then whatever is in the, the body of the method uh, actually refers to the internals of the client class. So if I type this in here, it's going to have a type of client. So if I hover over, you see those who are in the first row, those we probably can see, but on the last row, probably not visible. So the, the, this type is a client, not, not the uh, enclosing scope, right? So if we type this, we can actually have access to its internal fields from this methods, Twitter, handle, let's say we're gonna print the company name as well. Uh, company, you don't really need to type this anymore, right? name. Uh, so since we only have one, one line uh, in the body of the method, we can actually ask the ID to convert it to, okay, first of all, it can be a template, not the concatenation anymore. Uh, another one is that it could be an expression body instead of the full body, so equals mark and uh, and uh, an assignment looks like this. And we don't really need to explicitly declare the type anymore here. Uh, remove explicit type. So this is how it looks like. So the new extension method to console string is going to return uh, this thing, the Twitter handle and the company name on the receiver that is of type client. Right, so if we do that like this, to console string, you see like initially we didn't have this method in client, now we do. And we have to, since it's an expression, we actually have to put it into curly braces. So if we do that, execute it again, we should get a desired result. Perfect. Um, okay. So that's an extension method. That's really important to what we are going to do next. Uh, just as a side note, we can actually do the same for properties. So if we do client, client, let's, let's just do copy paste. Uh, and instead of declaring a function, we're going to declare a property and it's going to be the same name and uh, it's going to have a get should be a string. All right, so that's a property, but it does the same thing as the extension method and we can just refer to that new property. Cool, so it's the same again. Just run our unit test, perfect. So extensions, or a kind of idiomatic way in Kotlin to add new behavior instead of utility classes and static methods in Kotlin, in Java, right? Uh, the next thing, 
we, we didn't really do a lot of, you know, conversions towards uh, getting this nested structure yet, but it's our kind of a building block that we are going to use next to actually achieve what we want to achieve. Now, remember there was always an entry point. If you kind of creating, let's say, a company, there is like company and a block or Twitter, Twitter and a block or some kind of uh, other thing. So always, always some kind of a verb first and then there is a block where we have other features or uh, other attributes of that DSL. So we, we're gonna need uh, the same block right here and we are going to make the first step towards that. First, it will look ugly because we are going to use uh, Java idioms in Kotlin, but then we are going to remove them and we suddenly will see how, how uh, nice it is. So uh, usually the entry point is some sort of a method, right? Create HTML, create document, create client could be right here. So let's, let's create a new method called create client. And that create client should return client, of course. And uh, it, should it should have an, a block, right? It should execute a block. Uh, in, uh, in Java, how many of you are Java programmers actually? Okay, most of you. So in Java, there is a, like, we have lambdas, but they don't exist in like, they don't really exist. We, we have functional interfaces, right? So we need a functional interface to actually be able to de declare lambda as a parameter. So in Java, there is a, a functional interface called consumer. You know what it is? If, we ha if you haven't seen the Java doc of it, like it represents an operation that accepts a single input as an argument and return returns no results. So it's going to receive something, like we're gonna give it some kind of a object to work with, and we don't expect anything back. It's going to do some work with that object and uh, kind of create a result, a final result for us. Okay. Mm. Go back. So, and to build a client, we need a client builder. So the consumer is going to be parameterized as a client builder. Okay, so all builder uh, is going to be a client builder. Then we need to call the accept method on the consumer and provide the client builder. That's the argument for us, right? That's the parameter that the consumer is going to use to execute the block builder. And then once the job is done, it's going to have to return the result from the builder. Builder uh, build is going to return a client. So that's our kind of uh, entry point. And we are going to see how this entry point, um, how, how we convert it to a uh, native Kotlin idiom to actually achieve what we want. But let's, let's, let's call this method and see what will happen. So, uh, we need a val client, create client, uh, object. We need to create a pass in, pass in a lambda and uh, in, in uh, Kotlin, uh, the anonymous object is declared like this, consumer, uh, builder, a client builder, client builder. And like this, so we need, we have two clients anyways, we can fix it later. Implement the accept method and we need to uh, fill in the block, right? The accept method is that block and we actually have it implemented already in our code. We don't read the builder anymore because we have it in our uh, create client method. So I'm going to read, remove that, just remove that, sorry, just remove it. And we 
don't need this one as well anymore. So this whole block can now move into the uh, into the new method that we are implementing or in the new block, right? So it's right here, index set method, and we actually have a builder right here, builder, done. So now it compiles and we actually have the first nesting block. We have first block and we have an entry point. And now the IDE actually will start helping us to convert it into a more idiomatic, uh, let's say, code in Kotlin. So first of all, you probably don't see it on the screen, but actually the first line is underscored, underlined. And if I do alt enter, it will tell me that I can convert it to Lambda like this. And it will also tell me that I don't need really uh, the generic parameter anymore because it can be inferred in the compile time. And we have a cleaner code now. It still uses Java interface to actually pass in a block of code, but we can get rid of it now and see how it looks. Because in Kotlin, we have native lambdas instead of you know, functional interfaces. So we can get rid of the interface and instead of the interface, we can declare the, uh, the parameter of the method um, as a lambda or as a functional type. What we need to do is to say that this functional type is going to receive a client builder as a parameter and return nothing. A unit is a way of describing nothing in in uh, Kotlin. So now it's, uh, it's a functional interface and it, we can call it directly without the accept method. So we can just remove that. That's the whole transformation we need. Uh, and now you can see the ID already tells me that I can actually, since it's a Lambda, it's a native Lambda, and it's a single argument to that create client method. It can actually move, be moved out from the braces, from the parameters list. Uh, so we if you do that, alt enter, move lambda argument out of the parentheses, it actually will just remove the braces. You see, so the create client and we have a first block that we, you know, need it. Um, and now we have a lambda with a single parameter. In Kotlin, if the lambda has only a single parameter, it actually have an ex implicit name, which is it. Uh, it's derived from Groovy. If you use, used Groovy before, you know that it is kind of the, the parameter of the Lambda. And uh, since it's a single one and it has an implicit name, we can actually remove it to make it even cleaner. The ID will actually help us understanding what it, it, this it variable actually is. We know that it's client builder. Now, um, it looks pretty clean, right? It looks like a very good step forward. We have a kind of a first verb, create client, and we have a block. So inside that block, we have like not, not much of, like not, not too many lines of code, but uh, what is annoying is that I have to type it every time uh, I want to refer to some kind of um, a field or a member, a member of that client builder class, right? So to assign a name, I actually have to have to call a setter on it, which is annoying. I would like to do it like this, to have a direct access to that first name uh, instead of referring to some kind of a receiver. Sorry. So what if we make a little transformation here? So we, what we actually need is not an it receiver, but we need a this receiver. So since it's a this receiver, and if it will be a client builder of type client builder, we will not have to type it anymore, and we will be able to directly uh, refer to first name. So how to do that? We actually need to say that this lambda should be executed in the context of the client builder. And remember those two examples that I was telling you about? So that was the extension method. And this inside the extension method refers to the client, to the, uh, 
to the type where we kind of add this new method. So we could do the same here with a lambda. So we can say that this lambda should be executed in the context of the client builder. And the first name is now directly accessible from within that block. And if you look at this hint right here, this, right? So the client builder is now accessible by this reference instead of by it reference. So what we need, what we can do now is just, you know, remove those, those things and we have pretty clean code and that's all what, what we needed to actually make the transformation. Now we have two more blocks here that we could do the same with, right? So instead of writing Twitter, like Twitter builder, uh, assigning it to handle, we could do something like this. We could have a Twitter bl uh, kind of verb uh, followed by, uh, uh, by, by, by a block. And then we could assign the handle inside that block directly. So let's check how did you understand how it works. And you will tell me what do I need to do to actually implement this Twitter block. Can anyone help me? So Twitter, what, what, is, what is it? It's a method, right, that receives a block. So where this method should be implemented? Sorry? Right, right. So it should be an extension method of the client builder. Fun. Line builder, line builder, Twitter, and within that block, what kind of type should we access to directly assign the handle? Twitter builder, right? So it should be have, the block should be executed in the context of the Twitter builder. So we can declare that. There will be a block that is uh, an extension to Twitter, Twitter Builder. Perfect. And it can return nothing because we just, you know, we are executing within the context of the Twitter Builder. We don't need to do anything else. So now how do we execute this block within uh, the instance, right? We we actually would need to assign it to the the the, the uh, Twitter field of the client builder. So Twitter field is in client builder right here, right? So it belongs to client builder. Let me scroll it up a little bit. So Twitter is a field of client builder. Now we need to assign it with the result of this block execution within the context of the, the same type. So what we need here is to create an instance of this Twitter builder. So we have an instance and now we have to execute the, the block that we receive as a parameter within the context of that new instance. So for that, we have a helper method, like not a helper, it's actually an extension method on any type available in Kotlin, apply, now build. So we have an instance, we execute that block within that instance, we assign the results to the field. Boom. The block is compiled and we just, just in case, let's see. It works. Yeah, perfect. The unit test passes. So we, we can do the same now with, uh, with the company builder, right? So all we need to do is uh, create a new method called company. Uh, do that within the company builder type and company 
company builder apply block and we have to assign the result to the company field of the client builder done so the transformation is pretty easy now we need to open the block uh, move in those two lines into the block remove the company builder uh, we don't need this we don't need this done so we now have pretty nice dsl for building a client let's see it works it works and uh let's see so what we had in the beginning wasn't really terrible i mean everybody can read and understand the code but what's the difference? What's your impression? Like the code on the right and the code on the left. I mean, we didn't really win a lot of lines here. Let's see, just a few lines, like maybe 10%. But what's the difference? I would, I would say that uh, we definitely won not on the number of lines, but on the number of characters, right? It has structure. There is a structure. It's easier to parse with eyes, so the readability is kind of level up. Uh, the code on the right, everybody can read and understand it, but you have to read it, and you have to spend time reading it, right? So it's, I mean, it's not terrible, but it's easier to understand the code on the left. Right, so uh, the, the um, area of application for this kind of things, first of all, the builders, because if you want to read the documentation about it, it's going to be called type safe builders in Kotlin. And uh, no, it's uh, just a page. You will find everything there, all the small things that I have been using here. And another area of application is actually kind of creating configurations for something. It can be not just creating objects, it can be uh, kind of creating structures or cre describing the behavior. And it looks like a declarative uh, way of you know, programming, but still it's, it's the same Kotlin language. You can intermix it, you can extract it into a library, you can do all kinds of things with it. Right, right, exactly. So about the ID or the tooling help, right? So let me close this thing here. So one of the things is, is that, okay, writing this kind of code or you have created your own DSL, not a big deal, actually. You have a nicer code, but there are more things to it. Uh, first of all, if you, if you are creating, um, a new DSL, we are we going, what is the benefit of creating a new DSL? If you're going to use it just in one place in your program, there is no benefit. You have to reuse it. Then there is a benefit because actually the whole complexity is moved right here instead of being here, right? So if you start reusing it, this is where the benefit comes. And if you are not reusing it, then, you know, it's just a way to annoy your colleagues, probably. So then there is another step. So if you are starting to reuse it, if you start extracting this thing into a library, then we need to provide as many tools around this new solution to help people who are going to use it. So one of the things, are like, or one of the things you want to prevent is to making, like, is the user making errors or like unintended use of this new thing that you just created. So for instance, imagine if I don't remember how to press uh, the, the shortcuts with one hand. So imagine that this is unintended use. It should not be called like this. So for instance, in Twitter Builder, we might have a company method that is an extension to Twitter Builder, not to Client Builder. 
And if you write this code like this, it's kind of that, right? Or we don't want the user to intermix the blocks of code. And it should be a compilation error, but currently it's not. So there is a way to prevent that. Um, in, uh, I think, Kotlin 1.2, there added a new annotation called a DSL marker. So we can create, it's the, the DSL marker annotation is actually uh, a meta annotation. So you have to create your own annotation and derive from it. Um, DSL marker. So let's call it, for instance, client, client DSL. And then we can use this uh, annotation to mark the classes that participate in, in this DSL right now. So we need to mark the client builder. Uh, we need to mark the client and so on. In my current use case, which I declared for myself, is, um, the issue is that I cannot annotate those classes because they reside in somewhere in a dependency. Uh, but we can definitely extend, let's say, uh, class client client builder builder DSL and derive it from client builder and mark it with our own new new annotation called client DSL client DSL and then we can mark the methods as well but we, we are going to um, look at annotating the methods but uh, it's going to take time for me to annotate them all and extend them all. So I, I actually have a, um, a final solution because uh, what I will need to do also is to replace this client builder everywhere with my new client DSL, right? That's gonna take time. So let's uh, just comment this out like this. And I have DSL extensions file which does the same thing. So, but it, what it does here is uh, it, there, there is a, the new annotation, right? It creates the new classes and it uses the new classes within the methods. And what happens now is that there is no console string. Uh, okay, the, the blocks, we start moving in them again you will see that it's a compilation error. The, com the, the annotation is used by the compiler to check what should be the receiver of this method. Can uh, a receiver of company be of type Twitter builder DSL? Probably not, then it's a compil compilation error. So we cannot intermix the blocks of code anymore. Another feature of this annotation, which is undocumented and it's not really final, Mm. is that, as you can see, the color of this method is a little bit changed, right? It's not black anymore. It's kind of, I don't know, greenish or, or dark blue. Um, and the reason why, why it's a different color is that I annotated the, the methods as well. The annotation itself, the meta annotation, if we check it, it, it says that it's annotation class, so it should be used on top of classes, and it's a language feature. But you can use the same annotation right now. I mean, it might change. It might not be final solution. Uh, but you can use this annotation in the IDE or like to help the IDE to understand that this is a DSL method or the method that belongs to the vocabulary that you create for the DSL. And, uh, oops, where's the code gone? Uh -oh. Okay, it's a different file. <laughs> it was a different file. Anyways, so it's a different color. And uh, 
What else is important is that when you are using uh, the DSL created by someone else, you don't know which of the methods are actually meant to be used as DSL methods and which are not. So imagine if you are creating a, um, a configuration for, for a build configuration or something else, and you created the first block and then you think, what kind of attributes do I have in that block? Can I, can I kind of look up it somewhere? And the ID should actually help with you, uh, help with that. So it will place those uh, DSL methods on the top instead of, you know, sorting them by, by the name in nature order. So the f first of all, I have the, the DSL methods and, and then the methods or the fields, the members of the class uh, that I have to, that I can access within that block. So that's, that's pretty neat. Um, let's, let's see another uh, example of DSLs here. So this client, the client, oh, the client builder, I think. Yeah, it has a um, date of birth. So let's try to create a date, date of birth for, for him. So DOB, and it's a, it is of type local date local date of, uh, so what should be there? The year 2019, no, date of birth cannot be that much, 2000, let's say. The month, what's, what, what's the current month? June, what's the number? Six, are you sure? It's five, yes, you know, <laughs> because like, okay, June, 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 and if we go to B, ah, okay, anyways, it doesn't display that, but yeah, it's, it should be, if you do it like a number, it should be five. And then let's say 24, whatever. So, we now have a block of code that looks very nice here, and here we have some kind of a ugly, ugly expression. What could we do? Kind of create a new DSL just for this specific thing. I would say that that's a pretty um, challenging task right now, because there is no way to say that or express uh, the ranges for integers within the DSL. Like, uh, should should this first number uh, be like an int integer between, let's say, zero and uh, many thousands, or should the second integer be in the range between zero and 11? So there is no way to express that right now. But what I came up with uh, looks pretty nice, I would say. It's, it should be, oops, and so? And so I should be able to write something like 24th of June uh, year 2000. And it's a valid Kotlin code. How is that possible? So it's actually a hack, I would say. It's not that is advisory, but maybe for some, you know, limited use, you could do the same. So what's, what's, what's June? June is actually a method, an extension method for integer. And 2000 is a parameter for that method. So this is what I was actually writing. But why I was able to write that w without the dot and the brace. So if you go to the definition, the method is also marked as infix. So if we have a method that has only one parameter and that one parameter is an integer in, in my case, so it's an extension method on an integer that takes one parameter and we can say that it's an infix one, infix function, then we don't need to write a dot and braces around the parameter. And uh, I have used the type, type alias to just abbreviate the local date to LD in all my code right here. So 
what I have now is uh, 12 methods, 12 extension method that just, uh, you know, for, for the, uh, for the uh, month. And what else I could do here is say that it should be at, let's say, 12, 12 hours, no? It's zero, zero, something like this. No. Okay, I don't remember how to use my own DSL anymore. Okay, seconds. Okay, it should be hours first. At 12 hours, uh, 15 minutes, 15 seconds. No? Anyways, that wasn't the point. The point is you can create like chains of those calls with infix functions. The, the only problem is that it always needs to have uh, an argument. And if uh, you, you end with, let's say, 15 minutes and you don't have an argument, then the only thing you can do is to either uh, put a zero in there as a parameter or just ignore the parameter or declare it as a lambda and uh, use this empty block as a parameter for this call, which is a little bit annoying, but there is no other way because there are no uh, kind of infix functions without a parameter right now. Okay, so let's see. We have, do we have more time? Do we, we do, we can spend like 10 minutes probably. Um, I have an example for, okay, uh, perfect. So what do I have here? I have an example extending um, TeamCity DSL. So have anyone used TeamCity, the build server? No? Okay, so in TeamCity, um, it's, it was built UI first. It's pretty comprehensive uh, UI server, uh, UI, UI in TeamCity. Uh, you can configure everything through the UI. Uh, and some years back, we added, uh, let's say probably 10 years ago, all the settings could be serialized within XML files, which is not really human readable. Uh, and uh, they are meant mostly for versioning. So you could serialize whatever you created in the UI uh, into XML files and store it in version control and then compare what's changed, but actually doesn't really make sense. And uh, probably four years ago, we added a way to configure your builds uh, with Kotlin DSL. So in here, I have a settings file, which, uh, which is an entry point. That's a project. That's an entry point where we say that Within the project, we may have different build configurations. If you have used Jenkins, then a build configuration is same as a job. So different jobs within the project. And then uh, within that project, we may also have different uh, VCS routes, like Git, you know, any, any, anything. So, and those VCS routes could be attached to any of the build configurations as well to uh, for them to monitor the changes, uh, to uh, trigger on any changes and so on. So this build configuration, it's currently kind of a conventional form, the, the, the way I'm describing it right here, it's a object and I am deriving from the build type, but I can actually escape that and I can do everything in line and start uh, doing it like this, something like build, build, sorry, build type. And instead of a parameter, start building like ID. You see there is a like this, the block is a build type, like ID, some build, and then uh, uh, okay, so 
Oh, it should not be assignment, it should be a method call actually. So something like this and then uh, steps, steps to build uh, the whatever, whatever project I have, let's say Maven project and then goals to execute, clean package and so on. So I could use this kind of uh, in, uh, in line blocks or I could extract them because uh, you need a way to manage the complexity and to be able to separate the different build configurations into the files. And this is what I have, uh, have here right now. Uh, so I have just an entry point definition right here and all, everything else I have separately in a file. So then I actually will, would create an object, kind of a singleton, and uh, describe everything here. So it attaches to the same uh, repository where the settings are. So this is the project I'm building. That's a Maven project, right? And uh, I have a few steps which are, um, some of the steps are embedded in Team City, but some of the steps could be provided by third party plugins. And those third party plugins could provide extensions to the DSL. So for instance, here uh, I have Maven build step, which is embedded with Team City. It exists there already, but JFrog build step does not exist there. And that's my own extension. That's a custom one. That's something that anyone else could do. So I have it in a separate file. So I created a class called JFrog uh, CLI uh, for calling a, a CLI utility from command line. So otherwise it would be just a common line step. I would define a utility with the parameters and execute it. But I would like to provide my users a uh, more convenient way to execute it. So I, I'm creating this extension, creating the uh, JFrog extension method, creating a file, uh, creating a new kind of uh, value object with all this uh, new parameters that will be defined within the block and then execute it and return the result. So in my DSL here, you can see that the, uh, the attributes are of a different color because I marked them with the new annotation and they are also in the completion. So if you are using, uh, let's say, a configuration like this in a new tool like TeamCity, for instance, you have started using TeamCity and you want to configure your builds using Kotlin, then you need to know, like you're, you probably would like to have some assistance from the ID uh, and this assistance is provided like this, right? So we mark the, uh, the uh, methods or the members of the DSL with the specific annotation so that the ID completion could help you. That's kind of a one example how you can apply this knowledge of creating the internals DSLs within the real life situation, right? So if you have any questions for me, I'm pretty, Pretty done now. If you needed to uh, remember one thing, the most important thing of all the things I have been telling to you. So there is a lambda with the, like lambda with the receiver is the official name. So that's the most important thing for creating the internal DSLs. So just if you didn't really understand it, you know you will read it up, but you'd have to remember what what it was, lambda with the receiver, and that's the conventional way to express it. So you have a type, a dot, and a lambda. So you can add the lambda as an exception to any type. So, so the question is uh, about Groovy. So Groovy also was intended to be uh, used as DSL language. So what, uh, what, the, what the is the difference? Of, uh, okay, in this case? very good question. Um, so in, uh, in Groovy, you can create a DSL that looks pretty much the same, right? There is almost no difference. The difference is uh, in the way how it works. Uh, in Groovy, the DSL is relying on the uh, runtime uh, features of the language. So there is, um, method invoke and method missing methods 
on the object which are invoked at runtime. And then you kind of program those methods uh, to execute the logic for that specific DSL. Like if I didn't have a method on that object and then I still call it on that uh, object, then the method missing will uh, execute and by the name of that missing method, it will kind of create the new behavior. In here, it's all comp compiled time. You will not have the dynamic behavior anymore. It's all can be statically checked. You will get the compilation errors right in your ID upfront. So that's the big difference. Any more questions? Yeah. Thank you for your talk about Kotlin. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the language, so I'm not sure if this is possible. But uh, in the case with the numbers and the date that you showed us, I was wondering whether you could use some sort of regular expression with strings in order to allow for the range and then convert it back to an integer. But I'm not sure if that would be possible. Um, I'm not sure either. I, I, I haven't tried that solution. Um, I'm not sure how you can do that, actually. But one, one solution could be, uh, not with the regular expression, but there is an experimental feature called contracts right now. Uh, I, I haven't tried that, but I, I hope there could be a way to use contracts to define that the, um, the parameter of the method should be an integer within the range of from 0 to 11. And if that works, then uh, if we can apply that in the DSLs and uh, have compile time um, checks, maybe in some situations, but I'm not sure. You cannot, no, you cannot never know, like you cannot always know that there will be uh, an integer of a certain range at the compile time, right? Unless you use constants. It's not always possible. You, you may have assertions at runtime. Then it would work, but at compile time, you know, our goal is to have everything checked before we actually execute it. Yep. No more questions? Okay, if you have to learn or, yep. Um. So isn't DSL a fancy way of creating a configuration file or a settings file? Sorry, so, could, you, could you repeat? I'm saying isn't DSL a fancy way of creating a configuration file or a settings file? Like historically, people had been using XML or JSON to do that. So what advantages does DSL provide over that? Um, so if you have XML or JSON or any other, textual configuration file, it's pretty static. Unless you, let's say, let's say you want to generate something in a loop or have an if statement. That's, that you don't have by default in your kind of description. You, you may describe some kind of abstraction within the tool that will be parsing this XML or JSON where you define a verb and then say that, okay, if, if it's called if, then do something like pretty much like programming in ant but nothing else you you don't have a good way to create new abstractions for instance if i wanted to create a new way of describing pipelines in team city with kotlin dsl i'm able to do that i actually have that library if it was just a textual file and i didn't do any other kind of uh, thinking up front how, how I will extend it, then it's not, not going to work, not, not going to work, right? So that might be like a question to, um, in, in the area of the new CI uh, trends, like most of the new CI servers are using YAML for the configuration. And what, what I see is that they end up programming in YAML, creating scripts in like inline scripts in YAML because they didn't think upfront. And you never know what will come, you know, you cannot 
think so much forward how many new extensions you will have and how many new situations you will have. So that's why I think that the more expressive languages are more convenient for expressing like pipelines, let's say, for build pipelines. For single builds, like I want to execute a single task with these parameters, YAML, XML, whatever else, perfectly fine. Yep. Yeah, so you pretty much um, about uh, important usage in for build. Yeah. So we already have example of uh, Gradle, which was based on Groovy pretty much. So should we expect another build tool based on uh, Kotlin? No, um, so Gradle uses Kotlin. So you can use Kotlin. There is a build.gradle.kotlin or KTS mm -hmm. file that it looks pretty much as Groovy, but with Kotlin syntax. OK, so it's, it's already there pretty much. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's not developed by JetBrains. It's developed by, by Gradle themselves. Yep. All right. Um, so if you want to follow me up on Twitter or, you know, ask something later, there is my handle. If you want to try Kotlin without installing it, there is a nice website, trykotlinlang.org. Or if you have any questions, there is a Slack channel, or actually Slack workspace. There is a lot of channels on different topics. And there are many books now, um, let's say, some years ago, it was kind of a couple, couple of books only on Kotlin. Now, if you go to the website and open the list of books, it's just enormous. Just pick any and uh, read it. And there is a Coursera course as well by my colleagues. Uh, so if you, if you are feeling like learning Kotlin on Coursera, be our guest. So It's pretty cool. Didn't, uh, didn't Bruce Eckel originally write the Thinking in C++ book? All those years ago, that's a famous one, right? It's At Atomic Kotlin is written by him and our colleague as well. Right, right. Um, uh, I guess, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just old. Yeah, he, he, was, he was usually uh, writing books on like thinking in C++, yeah, yeah, yeah. thinking in Java. I was learning Java. Exactly, yeah, yeah. In Java. Very well known author. Now it's, cool. now it's Atomic Kotlin. There you go. I nice. don't know, maybe. It means you made it, you hit the big time. You hit the big time, right? Yeah, you got Bruce Suckle writing books. Yep. Have I ever been to Island of Kotlin? No, I live nearby almost, but I have never been. No, I haven't been there. Uh, folks on the Zoom, if you do have any questions, now is your time to chat it into the chat and get chatty. Going once. Okay. Wow. They're just being quiet. Huge crowd. <laughs> <laughs> We're slowly I'm getting... I'm being... Mom, I'm on the TV. That's right. That's right. <laughs> We're slowly getting the word out about the Zoom option uh, for people to attend. So please do spread the word. Tell your friends uh, that, that uh, you know, we published the Zoom info. We got all the kinks worked out for the most part. And, and uh, you know, so if you can't make it uh, for, a, for a Java, SF Java meetup, you can always join the Zoom. Uh, we're working on eventually, I don't know, we might get audio and get fancy at some point so that you can actually speak for yourself and ask the presenters quest questions directly and be sort of like the voice of God. But we're, we're not quite sure about that yet. That's, a, that, uh, that's on need, the roadmap. You, you need some as, sort as of developers like to say. special mic for that. That's right. That's right. Might be. Nice. All right. Well, we really appreciate you braving jet lag. And uh, what is it now, three in the morning for you? Uh, it's Four in the morning? almost five. Five a.m. woo -hoo -hoo. Yeah. And time to wake up. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everybody who came here. And uh, thank you for your questions. And I hope it was useful, at least. Uh, so I, I hope it wasn't time wasted. It's never time wasted when you have pizza, right?